Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. The Our Driving Concern Employer Traffic Safety Program is pleased to be able to offer the webinar, Impairment, the Cost to Employers. I want to welcome our presenter this morning, Lisa, this, this afternoon, Lisa Robinson with the National Safety Council. A few things to note before we get started. Everyone should be muted, but please press star six just to be sure if you used the phone-in method. You do have the ability to check questions during the webinar, and Lisa may answer your question during the presentation, or she may choose to address questions at the end. If you should encounter any problems or issues, please type us a message in the chat function and let us know. Handouts were attached on WebEx that included the presentation slides and tip sheets. If you had any issues accessing, you can let me know by typing in the chat box or emailing me at dn.crane at nsc.org. Lisa's contact information will be available on the last slide. There is also a very brief post-event survey at the conclusion of the webinar because this program is funded through grant dollars and provided at no cost to employers, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. With that, I welcome Lisa, and we'll turn it over to her to begin. Good afternoon. Thank you, Deanne, so much. You know, um, I do have a cough drop in, so I just want to let everybody know I'm getting over a cold, so if you kind of notice that, that's why. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. <clears throat> Impairment is such an important topic, especially in the workplace. Because impairment, you know, when we look at it, it has the ability to very quickly create a incident, an injury, even a death, or a lifelong disability. There's so much that can occur. You know, we think about that when we think about an incident, but also there's a lot more ramifications simply than just the incident, the injury, or death. There's a lot of costs involved. And so today, we're going to talk a little bit about impairment and what that looks like and the effect to the employer, and then we're going to have a few tips at the end about how to combat that as far as, as far as being an employer goes and what you can do. You know, really there's four Ds that we're focusing on today, and these are a lot of the things that, you know, distracted has been discussed quite a bit in the employer arena. Drowsy, I think, is a fairly new topic, fatigue or, you know, drowsy driving, that's kind of a fairly new topic. But it's also now being classified as impaired driving and then drug driving, of course. And we're talking about over-the-counter medications, prescription medications, and illicit drugs. So we're really talking about several things and drunk driving. So those are kind of the four areas that we're going to cover a little bit today. But what we really need to remember that there is no level of impairment that is safe. And when we talk about the jobs that employees do, whether we're talking about it in an office setting, out of an office setting, we're working remotely, it really doesn't matter. No level of impairment is safe when we talk about the employer arena. So I think that's a key thing to keep in mind because sometimes people will say, well, you know, if you're at 0.08, and really what we need to remember is no level is a safe level. And I think that's an important distinction when we think about impairment. So, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about fatigue, alcohol, drugs, and distracted driving. You know, and the reason why, because again, these are all risk factors. These all impact the employer, whether we talk on or off the job. Because we do talk about, you know, the slower reaction time, decreased cognitive and the motor skill function, potentially falling asleep, definitely impaired judgment. Again, these all have the ability for an injury or fatality, not only that, a level of exposure to risk, liability, and cost. All of these are costly for the employer and the employer's bottom line. And every employer is making decisions on how to keep their employees and their workplace safe while looking at their costs to do it. So when we look at that, you cannot overlook the fact that the bottom line is impacted when we talk about things that can impact safety. I'm also going to share a little bit of data and information, and one of the reasons I'm going to share a little bit of data that I gathered for you is I work with so many employers 
And so many of the employers just seem so surprised by some of the data and the information. And I really believe that information is power. When you have the knowledge, you have the ability to do something about it. But so many of the employers don't really understand clearly how the workplace is truly impacted by um, drugs. You know, when I say drugs, I'm talking about alcohol or other drugs, you know, whether we talk about over the counter. So I want to share a little bit of the data. As I mentioned, you know, out of the percentage of estimated to 68.9, um, over ages over 18 and older, they're employed full time or part time. 22.4 million illicit drug users. They're employed. So again, they're in our workforce. They are working with us, and you know, they're our coworkers, or they're working under us, or they're working at our company. So it is occurring, right? And we know that an average of 8.7% of full-time workers who are over 18 to 64 use alcohol heavily just in the past month. You know, and I know we always go, well, alcohol, it's, it's legal if you're, you know, over 21, right? But what we have to remember is if they're a heavy alcohol user, were they impaired at any point while they were employed, you know, and again, on or off the job can impact the employer's bottom line and cost. Right? And the same with illicit drug use, and the same with, you know, and again, another thing is dependent on or you abused alcohol or illicit drugs in the past year. So keeping in mind that this is data that's been collected that helps the employer to understand it is occurring in the workplace and you can't really deny it and you can't really overlook it. Another key component is 22.5% of the people admitted to using drugs or alcohol in the workplace during work hours, okay? This is occurring in the workplace. I know there's been many times that I've been at lunch and I've seen people that are definitely for a company sitting there and having alcoholic beverages during the workday. They have on clothing that identifies their company, maybe their name, and it is during the work hour. So again, we know that it's occurring in the workplace, but we just sometimes kind of overlook because we think, well, surely not. You know, don't people know better? And we sometimes forget, you know, that this data is there to help employers combat it, make decisions, and make it a part of their safety culture. So I think that's important. Another component seems to be marijuana in the workplace. That is a really hot topic. You know, that seems to be something that, you know, right now everyone's looking at. And we do know that marijuana, as well as the rest of the you know, as I mentioned, the illicit drugs, over-the-counter drugs, prescription drugs, and alcohol, we know that marijuana is also in that arena as well, and you can't overlook that one either. Another thing that I think is really important to know is that, you know, OxyContin and Vicodin have been used while at work without having a medical need to do so. People sometimes believe because it's been prescribed for their use and because a doctor has prescribed it that it's okay to use. I will also say that a lot of times people are not taking the time to read the warning labels that are on their medications. Also, we know that a lot of times somebody will share a medication with somebody else because they believe it's okay to do so because, again, a doctor prescribed it. And so that's something to keep in mind that when we're looking at, we know that a percent of the population are utilizing medications for medical reasons or possibly not a medical need while in the workplace. And we know that these numbers continue to rise. And so, again, that's something that we need to make sure that we're aware of. Many substances impair an employer, an employee. And one of the reasons why I put driving in parentheses, because driving is one of the components, but every single employee who is impaired you know, whether we talk about driving or not driving, they can be impaired doing their job function. I think that's an important thing, whether we talk driving or non-driving, an employee can be impaired by substances. And again, as I mentioned, over-the-counter prescription, and we also think because alcohol, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to drink it, it should be fine. And so sometimes we kind of forget that those are, those are conversations that we need to have when we think about our safety program, right? You know, and a lot of times, we sometimes forget the driving aspect 
of the job that we execute. You know, somebody may be hired to trim trees for a living, that's part of their job function, or part of their job is to maintain roadways, or maybe they are picking up waste, right? Those are the job functions, but to execute that job function, it requires that they drive as a part of their job. Sometimes we are forgetting that component because we're focused on the job responsibilities that they were actually hired to do. And we know that when people are using you know, medications or different substances, they can amplify and it can create other issues when it comes to aggressive driving, reckless driving, and again, slow coordination, all these things that we've talked about. And so understanding that we need to also focus on the fact that if they have any sort of driving aspect as a part of their job on an, you know, again, any sort of aspect, we can't forget that component when we look at everything all together. Drowsiness, again, we know that fatigue and drowsiness, we know that a lot of medications cause this to happen. So we can't overlook that, especially making sure that we're educating our, educating our employees on some of the things that can occur, especially are they operating heavy machinery? Are they working in work zones, right? These are all important components. And that's why it's important that we're talking to them about the driving aspect, using motorized equipment, even heavy operating equipment, anything that can cause injury. Okay. As I mentioned before, we know that alcohol, we know that a lot of people are social drinkers, right? But we also know that a lot of people are unable to control how much they drink. So that's where they have a problem with alcohol and alcohol use. And so again, just because it's, legal, it's a legal substance for certain ages to use, we can't overlook that as a component impairment, right? So we know that it costs money. And I think this is a really important thing to remember is the employer is the one that's paying. Whether we talk about job absenteeism, we talk about health complications, and again, on or off the job, but also we have lost productivity. Again, all of these affect the employer's cost as well as the bottom line. And that's, again, not even just talking about safety. These are costs that the employer may be affected by. So we know through some testing that alcohol and workplace, so we know that breathalyzer tests showed that about 16% of employees at the emergency room were injured during the work due to alcohol, okay? We also know that workers reported drinking during the workday at least once in the past year, 24%, and we know that some of the workplace fatalities were alcohol related. Again, this is just data that helps you understand why our safety programs in the employer arena need to be all inclusive. We need to think about more than things, you know, because again, more than the bottom line is affected. Some data is, is elusive to get, right? Some data is hard to determine the impact because, you know, there's different things. It can be company size, industry, cost may not be easy to see, what's the cost of doing business. There's a lot of things that you may not actually see tangibly, but there are costs associated with it. So there are going to be other there can be some emotional costs as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about a few of the other costs that employers are going to see. We also know NETS did a great job of gathering some data in a few years back that show us the difference in cost with property damage and non-fatal injury and a fatality injury and how an employer is affected by this, right? So again, as I mentioned, when it comes to driving, we can't really overlook the impact. We also know that those who drive but don't drive all the time, have a little bit higher of a crash rate or a fatality rate. Part of that is maybe we're not giving them the same focus as we do our full-time drivers. And so we need to think about when it comes to driver safety and driver behavior, thinking about 100% of our employee population because so many of our employees drive to and from work as well as driving as a part of their job. And when I'm talking about that, I may be talking about somebody that does a brief errand for the company. Maybe it's not the person who's trimming the trees that's consistently in the vehicle, but or the person who fills in for somebody else. So we have to keep in mind these costs are significant and everybody's impacted. And again, when we start talking about a lot of, again, when people are impaired, you know, they tend to make choices like speeding, 
they take more risky choices like not wearing their seatbelt. So we know all of these impact an employer's cost. They all have a direct effect on how much employers are paying as a result of these crashes. What about lost work days, right? We always think, well, people take PTO. They have sick time, right? We know that on and off the job crashes, we know that the employer is seeing that. But we also know that lost work days, which is lost productivity, and that has a whole lot more of a trickle effect than simply not being at work for that day. But we know that those off-the-job crashes are just as impactful as on the job. And so it's really important that we think about our safety program as being a 24-7 type of safety program. Our goal when we think of employer safety is how do we affect our employee and how do we make sure that our safety messaging is actually also going home, right? We want to have an effective program. We don't want to have a safety program just to say we have a safety program. Our safety program should have impact. If we're investing in a safety program, we want that employee to be buckling up 24-7, not just from 8 to 5 or not just when they're in that company vehicle. We need them to be buckling up all the time, and we want our messaging and our information to also be going home. So again, on and off the job, billions, not millions, this is billions of dollars that employers are paying every year. And I always tell people, we see our fringe rates going up. We see all these costs to do business going up. And at some point we have to say, you know, that investing in safety will help change that for companies. So what about the impact? I was talking about this briefly a minute ago. So what about the impact? I think the brand is so important to talk about because I think it gets overlooked. What's the brand of the company? We've heard in the news, whether it's, you know, the, you know, it's a TV news, a newspaper news, social media, you will hear very quickly if something happens. You'll hear very quickly if that employee was impaired. You'll see very quickly, is there a brand tied to it, right? How, what's the cost to your brand when something happens? And everything can go viral very quickly with information. What about the impact to your coworkers? So if you've got an employee who is impaired on the job, that provides a risk for the coworkers, right? But what if that employee is gone from work and they're not there repeatedly? Maybe they have reduced work time as a result of a suspended license, right? How does that impact the coworkers? Is the coworkers having to do more work? Are they having to pick up the work? What about if an employee is no longer able to do their job and they've got to be replaced? Now you have workers that are having to pick up that workload, right? So employers are affected. What if there was a crash, okay? Now you've got the emotional toll that the work, workers feel, the coworkers feel. There's a lot how a coworker is impacted based on their other coworkers. What about the loss of productivity? I made a comment earlier about loss of productivity, and sometimes we say, well, Somebody's out sick today, so this isn't happening. Well, does that mean our customer's order isn't going to go out the door that day? Are they going to be delayed in getting that, right? There's a difference in a smaller company and a larger company when we talk about this. But how is that customer affected? So again, it really impacts the company in the bottom line whenever that loss of productivity is occurring. What about liability? Employers have a lot of liability anymore, and we hear a lot about lawsuits, the exposure to liability. That is significant. What about fines? Can companies be fined? You know, that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. What about the fringe cost? You know, our health care coverage. We know that the fringe cost is significant when we start talking about health care, you know, and, and injury, whether we talk about the employee and or family members. And we know those costs have continued to go up. So that impacts an employer's bottom line. I made a comment a minute ago about, you know, risk and exposure to liability. But what about the legal cost? Is having a legal team, an attorney, you know, access to legal, legal guidance and legal support, is that just the cost of doing business? Or am I going to need more legal support as a result of incidents that are going on, right? What about rehiring and retraining? 
that cost is significant as well. What about that loss of knowledge? What if it happens to be an employee that you've had for 10 or 12 years that has significant knowledge? You know, again, different job scopes are going to be impacted differently, different size of companies. But again, that rehiring and that retraining, that is a significant cost that sometimes gets overlooked in the whole scheme of things because we say it's the cost of doing business. But we know that investing in our employees that we have that are currently employed has benefits. And again, the risk. What's that exposure liability? What's that you know, exposure to injury? For that employee, a community member, or a coworker? Again, safety is impacted, right? Safety can be compromised. What if that employee is unable to perform the job that they've been hired to do? What if they're no longer able to drive? What will happen? What about the Im impact in the workplace? You know, again, smaller companies may have a larger impact where a larger company won't have as a big an impact. Again, a lot depends on the type of job that this employee does. We know, based on SHRM, some things that they've said, that it may the cost to that company to replace a salaried employee can be six to nine months salary on average. That's a lot of money and sometimes we overlook because we have people working in HR, right? And this is their job responsibility. So while well, people are learning, you know, you've got customer service errors and issues. Again, there are a lot of costs that sometimes we don't put a dollar figure to and sometimes we forget that they're an important component but as a result of safety, these things are affected. Well, and as I said earlier, I've mentioned multiple times about the economic impact. We cannot overlook that the employer is paying significantly due to a variety of things, but we know that lost productivity is estimated at about $55 million in expense. So we know that we're seeing that because employer, or excuse me, employees have reduced productivity due to an illness, the inability to concentrate, and possibly a family member is also affecting them. So you have to really keep in mind that 55 million workers in the U.S. annually experience this reduced productivity. And again, when that reduced productivity, even if they are at work, the employer is affected as well as the coworkers. So how does that affect you, right? What's the cost in that? $200 billion annually is the result of lost productivity due to drugs in the workplace. $200 billion. That's a significant cost. What about presenteeism? I made a comment a minute ago about being present, right? But you've got the loss of productivity, the loss of the ability to really do their job well they're present, but they may not, it may not always be apparent because they're there, but they're not able to perform their job up to standard. So that's a, that's a term that you know, kind of need to think about because a lot of times we've seen people, and, and I know we've all felt that way when we're not up to par, but we go ahead and go to work. We're present, but our workability isn't quite as good. Research has found that less time lost from, from people staying home. So if a person is sick or there's an injury, they have found that people that stay home, there's less productivity, there's less problems, there's less lost time when those people actually stay home than being at work and being, um, being present. So what about different job industries and different job tasks? Impairment can affect both the quantity of the work and the quality of the work, right? So again, you've got risk as well as productivity. Somebody may work slower than usual. What if that's an assembly line? How will that affect that? Different types of impairment have different effects on what that company is going to experience. And again, medical things that occur, such as depression, and people are medicating for that, right? We know that reduced performance at work is costing employers $35 billion. Pain conditions, right? Again, these are, these are, you know, health issues, correct? 
but they're taking prescription medications over the counter, possibly even for headaches and back, pay, back problems, right? Again, that's costing the employer about $47 billion. We know that pain, no matter what that cause, translates into lost work time as well. Again, lost productivity is averaging about $1,600 per employee per year. About $1,600 per employee per year. So everybody's affected by this. Everybody's affected by this. So let's talk a little bit about fatigue. Because fatigue is really relatively new when we start looking about risk. But there's also a price tag associated with it as well at about $136 billion a year in lost productivity. All of this is going to affect the employer. It's also going to have risk tied to it. It's also going to have the potential for deadly consequences as well when you look at fatigue. Excessive fatigue is considered an impairment. NISA has come out, come out and said that when someone is fatigued, it is driving impaired. So just like being intoxicated at the workplace, being fatigued. And a lot of times people go, oh, I'm really tired. I didn't get a good night's sleep. And we just kind of bypass it and go, oh, we're just really tired. We're a tired society. But really, there is significant risk when we have a workforce that's fatigued or a workforce coming in that's tired. You know, through the National Safety Council, we know that some data shows us that about 30% of people report dozing off behind the wheel. We know that driving on four to five hours of sleep, and a lot of people are, you know, are braggers and they'll say, oh, I operate just fine. But we know that their crash risk is significantly higher four times. So we know that losing two hours of sleep is similar to having three beers. And I always say, would you drive with three beers? <coughs> Excuse me, would you operate heavy machinery after drinking three beers? And so it's the same concept. We know that about 13% of workplace injuries are caused by sleep problems, and we know that there's a price tag to that. That's about $136 billion annually in lost productivity. So you can't overlook fatigue in all the same other categories, some of the other risk categories, right? So what about distraction? Distracted driving has been on the radar for a very long time. A lot of employers have really great policies and they're addressing distracted driving. They're looking at it and realizing it's a problem, right? But we have to understand that that work day, the commute to and from time, even off the job, is important. And we get asked a lot about the hands-free, but we know that hands-free is not risk-free. We know that people believe that holding that phone is what makes the difference, and it's a cognitive, it is not the holding of the phone. It's being present when you drive right? Your brain cannot toggle back and forth. And we know that that's challenging for, for people to understand because we think that we are a multitasking society. But we know that we can't do those two tasks at the same time when it comes to driving and talking. So it's challenging. And I'm not talking about the passenger in the vehicle. I'm talking about that phone conversation that's going on. You know, when you are on the phone and you're looking at the windshield, that driver can miss seeing 50% of what's around them. I always tell people to kind of look at what you, you, know, you can't see. It's like blinders. So you miss them so much. So that risk is significant. And I always say this type of driver behavior is completely preventable. We have the choice to make decisions that keep us safe. You know, one of the things that we say is you need your eyes on the road, hands on the wheel, and your mind, mind driving. And I always remind people, how, many, how often have you driven, but you don't remember what route you took? Your mind was engaged on something else. And we have to, be learn, we have to learn to be present while we drive. We have to learn that we've got to be actively engaged in driving. You know, it's, you know we're lucky to be able to drive a vehicle. It's a weapon. We have to understand the responsibility that comes with that vehicle and understanding that we need to do our primary task, which is drive while we're behind the wheel. So, and people think that I can do all these things, but they can't. You know, people, and I've seen all sorts of things happen behind the wheel, holding a book, all these different things. 
um, eating. People think that they can do these things, but you can't do either well. You cannot do either well, which that opens up risk. People believe that using a voice to text is okay, but new studies are showing that it's actually more distracting than typing text by hand. And so we always say all technology, you know, put it away, put that phone away, just drive. That is the safest way that you reduce, you know, driver behavior that can create error and cost as well as injuries. And one of the things that you can do is have a really great cell phone policy. Employers are really able to make decisions and provide policies that keep their workforce safe. We know the best ban is a total cell phone ban. Not a hands-free, but a total cell phone ban. We know that that is the best way to keep your workforce safe. So what are a few of the steps that you can do is awareness. Managers, supervisors, safety leaders, risk managers, HR, human resource professionals, they need an awareness of the four Ds. They need to be knowledgeable about these four Ds that we've talked about today. You've got to invest in safety. It can't be an afterthought. We can't chase it afterward as a result of incidents. We need to make safety the priority. It needs to be the primary prevention. One thing that's really important is that you review, you revise, you implement, you educate, and you enforce your company's policies. That's so important. Another thing is to train your supervisors, but you need to continually train them. You need to continually educate. And a lot of times people think that training and education has to be these day-long trainings, these hour trainings, but they can be short opportunities that you take to keep the information fresh and relevant. As you change and you've got new supervisors, new people that are hired, you know, even the coworkers need to be trained. One of the biggest components, though, is your workforce. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you educate and you work with your employees on topics. Education is so important when we think about safety. And I always say, educate the employees, repeat. Educate the employees, repeat. Skip the one and done. A lot of times people think I need to have my yearly safety meeting. No, we need to capture every two minutes and we can educate our employees in so many different creative ways so that all these topics when it comes to safety, especially these four Ds, that we've done a really good job at making sure our employees understand how we keep them safe. Also, a driver safety program. A driver safety program that's comprehensive, well thought out, planned, and executed. I want to thank you guys for caring about impairment in the workplace. I want to I want to thank you again for joining me today. All the slides are available and they're attached. This is my contact information. You are more than welcome to contact me at any time with any questions you may have. And I know that we offer other webinars on the signs and symptoms of impairment, and I encourage you also to sign up for some of those webinars as well because that gives you a little bit more of a focus on what to watch for in the workplace. So again, thank you for your time today, and Deanna, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Lisa. Are there any questions for Lisa? If you have a question, if you wanna type it in the chat box while we're wrapping up, I'll, uh, Lisa and I'll be watching for those. As Lisa mentioned, uh, the signs and symptoms of impairment. We do have a webinar coming up on December 11th. So please make sure that you look at our website and register for that. And again, that's December 11th, the signs and symptoms of impairment. So please make sure you join us for that webinar. And as for wrapping up, I don't see any questions coming in. I do want to thank Lisa for being our presenter today and giving uh, so much great information for you as employers to take back and start using right away. And we also want to thank you for joining us today. We know your time is valuable, and we hope you gained a lot of information. Uh, make sure you do, uh, uh, do our post-event survey. It's a short one, but it does help us. And with that, we want to... Um, Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. And that concludes our webinar for today. Have a great day.